Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and today we are going to talk about the 60 Starlink satellites that SpaceX just launched in a groundbreaking mission. But more than that, we are going to talk about why this mission is such a big deal. I mean, they're just satellites, right? Surely we already have plenty of satellites around our pale blue dot by now. After all, you only need to look at the stuff in space side here to see just how much stuff is up here. Working satellites, debris, you name it. There is loads of stuff up here. Here is the thing though, SpaceX have just started an amazing long-term mission, not for any other launch provider, but for themselves. So this amazing set of missions aims to create a super low latency telecommunications network. And how are they going to do this? Not by launching just these 60 satellites, which let's face it is a damn amazing mission by itself, but by launching around 12,000 satellites in three sophisticated orbital shells around the world. No big deal, right? The better question might be why are SpaceX attempting to create this network? As Elon Musk stated back in 2015, there is a significant unmet demand for low-cost global broadband capabilities. So making a more affordable, high-performance broadband network is in everyone's best interest. I don't know about you, but I can always use more internet bandwidth and performance. The second key point here is that the communication satellites are currently extremely expensive. In many cases, the satellite being launched on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is actually much more expensive to build and manage than the massive rocket that pushes it to orbit. Let's take the Amos 6 satellite from 2016 that was lost when the Falcon 9 exploded. That payload was worth around $200 million, and this was by no means a stupidly expensive payload compared to other satellites. Now, a Falcon 9 mission using SpaceX's standard plan is stated to be around the $62 million mark. So wait, this means that in the case of that single Amos 6 satellite, the actual payload was worth well over three times the cost of the gigantic freaking rocket underneath that places it in orbit. And that's just for one single satellite. SpaceX, in comparison, have just launched 60 Starlink satellites at a time. So in terms of cost savings, we can work out the difference here. We just, we take the 60, we, we multiply it by the cost, we factor in, you know, Oh, you know, it's going to work out a hell of a lot cheaper than that single $200 million satellite, isn't it? So just like what SpaceX have done with the cost of rockets, they are now looking at disrupting a large number of communication industries starting with this plan for dominating global broadband satellite networks. Now, I'm not going to jump in and describe the various competitors and networks that exist that may need to keep a close eye on what SpaceX are attempting to do here, but I will just quickly say that these competitors are going to be just a little worried that the cheapest rocket launch provider are now manufacturing and launching equally low-cost satellites. Now, I've had a number of people ask what the cost for each of the 60 Starlink satellites on this mission was, and I haven't been able to find any real concrete numbers on that at this point. The entire project, encompassing the full 12,000 satellites though, is estimated at around $10 billion, and actually that figure was announced quite a long time ago. For all we know, the total cost may be significantly lower now. The old estimate had many more individual launches with, I believe, around 20 to 30 satellites for each launch. I'm not 100% sure on that. Regardless to say, though, if you know some more about some specific numbers here, I'd love to hear from you in the comments because this could be even more amazing than what I'm describing here. Anyway, let's for now assume 10 billion. If we divide that 10 billion by the 12,000 satellites, it gives us around $833,000 per satellite. And even if we dramatically round that up to, let's say, a million dollars per satellite, that would mean that the launch cost for all 60 satellites here would come to a grand total of $60 million. And that presumably includes the Falcon 9 it will be flying on. So compared to a $200 million cost for a single satellite, that is just crazy. As I said a moment ago, the customer price for a Falcon 9 mission is just above this $60 million mark. However, based on a number of estimations we've seen over the last year or so, it does suggest that SpaceX's own internal costs 
for flying a reused booster lowers this cost dramatically, potentially as low as somewhere between 10 and 20 million dollars. So SpaceX are going to be very much relying on that super low cost reflight that they've been pushing for with the latest Block 5 iterations of the Falcon 9 rocket. Now I can already see my comment thread going crazy because I'm not comparing apples with apples. The Amos 6 satellite was of course a much larger satellite designed for very different purposes and I know myself that suggesting this first launch will be that lower cost will be a little optimistic. Like anything innovative however, the costs will start off higher and then get more affordable for SpaceX as new launches take place. So let's take a look at how 12,000 satellites placed around the world is going to work. Back in November 2018, Professor Mark Handley of University College London created a very neat animation of how the satellite constellation will potentially work. Now there's a link to the original video in the description here as he dives right into how each satellite is likely to communicate with its siblings in the network. It's actually a really interesting watch and he also has included links to his research paper and also mentions slight corrections in some of the findings since the animation was created. We also just saw a similar style animation quickly direct from SpaceX just before this first Starlink launch. So let's just talk a little more about the performance aspect of this network. As also stated by Mark Handley, as existing network bandwidths have increased, latency has emerged as being the limiting factor for many network systems, ranging from the extremes of high frequency trading to the more mundane effects of latency on voice over IP, uh, online gaming and web performance. Fundamentally, once traffic engineering has mitigated congestion and buffer bloat has been addressed, for wide area traffic the remaining problem is that the speed of light in fiber optic cables simply isn't fast enough as of course light travels a lot slower in glass than it does in a vacuum. Now SpaceX's proposed Starlink constellation of low Earth orbit satellites will provide low latency, high bitrate global internet connectivity. And there's a great deal of detail in the FCC filings about the links between the satellites and the ground, including how many antennas can steer narrow transmission beams for both uplinks and downlinks. And the filings actually don't cover a great deal of detail about the satellite to satellite communications, but it is mentioned that space lasers will be used. Now, as far as anyone could see, there was no radio spectrum for satellite to satellite communications requested in the filing, so it's currently assumed that lasers must be the primary communication link between the satellites themselves. I don't know about you, but I find all of this super interesting. The end result of such a network is that these space lasers will communicate at the speed of light in a vacuum, which is around 47% higher than in glass. Think of the implications to all this for just a moment. If satellites are placed in a low Earth orbit rather than where the vast majority of communication satellites are located, the latency differences would be drastically reduced. So in the first Starlink launch we saw all 60 satellites loaded aboard the Falcon 9. The rocket of course had already been used twice before, once during the recent Telstar 18 mission in September 2018 and also during the Iridium 8 mission back in January of this year. The Falcon 9 launched the payload to around 440 kilometers above the Earth. The second stage then separated and the satellites were deployed beautifully and as we learnt from an interesting little tweet from Elon Musk uh, a little while ago now there is no dispenser on this vessel. So how did SpaceX actually deploy the satellites? It's actually quite simple. What they do is they simply induce a slow spin on that second stage and simply detached the mechanism holding the stack together. All satellites were released in one hit, letting them slowly drift outwards as the second stage slowly drifted away, correcting itself so that we could all continue to view that stack as it slowly drifted apart. This was really awesome to see. Now initially the satellites don't actually need any control to separate themselves from each other. This simply happens slowly and naturally over the course of several hours or even several days. As soon as SpaceX are able, they will then begin using their Krypton powered ion thrusters on board each Starlink satellite to ascend to their eventual operation orbit at a height of 550 kilometers. 
I really can't wait to see reports on how all of this is going to roll out. A few more interesting bits of technical awesomeness has also been tweeted by Elon over the last few weeks, such as this sweet little bit of information here stating that the Starlink mission will be the heaviest SpaceX payload ever at 18.5 tonnes. If all goes well, each launch of 60 satellites will generate more power than the space station and deliver one terabit of bandwidth to Earth. And then stated that six more launches of 60 satellites for an initial activation, 12 launches for significant coverage. Of course, I can hear my commenters telling me already why don't they just launch more satellites again on a Falcon Heavy? But there is no more room in the fairing to fit any more. It might be time for SpaceX perhaps to think about creating a longer payload fairing for the Falcon Heavy. It is starting to feel just a little restrictive. So anyway, the first launch has been completed. Even better still, the first stage was recovered and the fairings were picked up a very short time later. SpaceX, you are really starting to make this look too easy. So if we again take a look back at some more of Mark Handley's videos, we can actually see how this network may evolve over the next few years. It is certainly going to be amazing to watch this all roll out and I would really love to see someone create a tracker so that we can all watch how these orbits are going to evolve in real time. The long term plan for the Starlink satellite constellation will be broken up into several phases. In phase 1, around 1600 satellites will be placed in a constellation at an altitude of this 550 km altitude. Subsequently, the plan is to then place around 2,800 satellites in a constellation at an altitude of around 1,150 kilometers, and then finally 7,500 satellites at the lowest altitude of 340 kilometers. So if SpaceX can indeed run a global broadband service, what could this mean from a revenue raising point of view? In a recent call with reporters, Elon Musk said that there's a fundamental goodness inherent in improving internet access, but there should certainly be a lot of money in the enterprise as well, perhaps up to $50 billion per year for SpaceX. Now for SpaceX, this is a huge deal, as currently they have a rough revenue topping out at around $3 billion. The extra money from such a massive constellation would certainly beat Elon's earlier plans to steal underpants to help fund SpaceX's primary goal to help humanity become a multi-planet species. So very best of luck in all future Starlink launches, SpaceX. We are all watching and we all have our fingers crossed that these first missions will all go to plan. I'd like to thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. Please do take a second and hit that like button. All of your support is just awesome. If you have any comments or questions, please do whack them down in the comments below. If this video has earned your subscription, welcome to the channel. And for all my existing subscribers, a massive thank you for your continued support. I could not do this without you. A huge thank you also to my very dedicated quality control squad listed here. You guys are incredible. Checking through all my rough thoughts, ideas and facts to make sure the quality of these videos are top notch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video on the recent Crew Dragon Anomaly. Still don't know a lot more about that but we are certainly waiting on some more news. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.